Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first episode of Backlot 605. My name is Casey, and with me as always will be my co-host, Brian. What's up? How's it going? It's going good. Good. So, uh, briefly, if you could tell the people out there what uh, this podcast is kind of going to be about. Basically, what we're looking at doing is get, being able to get our talk on in regards to movies, whether it be national you know, recognized movies, your Netflix movies, your TV movies, or even your local events here in Sioux Falls. You and I are the kind of kind of people that just like to talk movies, whether, you know, whatever it is, if it's big, it's a little, whatever the case is, we just want to be able to get a good place where we can get on, get our ramble on and try to get some of our thoughts out there and see what other people think. That's exactly what it's going to be. Just a bunch of rambling, incoherent stuff about movies. I'm good at that. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, kind of this first episode is just going to be our introduction episode, a few things about the news and, uh, upcoming movies, maybe a review of something we saw this week, but, uh, I think we should start it off with this one question, just so the listeners know a little bit about us. So what is your kind of uh, movie that got you into movies? Maybe it's a specific movie you saw as a kid or a specific moment in a movie. What exactly would that be for you? Well, overall, for me, just maybe, and maybe this is just dating me, but, you know, for me, you know, my favorite all-time movie is like a, almost like a dead heat between Goonies and Back to the Future. I almost look as Back to the Future is that you need to have all three of those movies. It's like the perfect trilogy. Goonies is that good standalone where even though they've been talking about a sequel for the last few years now. A few 30 years. Uh, but yeah. yeah. And I know that Richard Donner and Steven Spielberg and all of them are all for it. And I'm like, you can just leave it alone. I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. I've always had a fascination with movies. It's that weird fantasy outlet to be able to say, you know, just kind of get out of the real world for a minute, you know. And especially with Back to the Future, you know, you know, I watched that as a kid going, so this is what my future is going to lo hopefully look like. And was I sadly disappointed? Absolutely. Because we're not flying in cars yet. No, but I think we are living in the Biff future. So <laughs> absolutely living in the Biff future. <laughs> <laughs> so that moment for me was uh, kind of a, I was about five years old. And I remember I walked into a pizza hut with my dad and there was a cardboard cutout of a specific Star Wars character by the name of Darth Maul, promoting The Phantom Menace. And uh, that just intrigued me. I'm, so I asked my dad, I'm like, what, what is this guy? He's like, oh, that's uh, from those Star Wars movies. He's like, you want to watch them sometime? I'm like, yeah. So he uh, borrowed the VHS tapes of them from my cousins, and we sat and watched the original trilogy, and I was hooked right away. At least he started you with the good trilogy. Well, the other trilogy wasn't out yet. It was in the, They were promoting for Phantom Menace. So oh. in 1999, I was five years old. Wow, you're five years old, and I'm already out of high school. I'm, I am getting old here, aren't I? <laughs> but uh, so we sat and watched them. But this pack of movies that they had was actually a four pack of VHSs. So it was four pack. Yeah, it was New Hope, Empire, and Return of the Jedi. But the fourth one was Special Features. But to a five year old kid, you're not going to know what Special Features means. I thought yeah. it was a fourth one. So I just sat and watched it, and my whole world exploded because I thought Star Wars was real up to that point. And then I watched it, and it was just guys with cameras. And little miniatures and, and things like that. Yep. And that's what got me into loving movies and wanting to know more about behind-the-scenes stuff and how movies are made. So Star Wars is my, my go-to. The special features, especially when, like, DVDs came out, that's when you're just going to be able to actually have that opportunity to see some of that stuff because, you know, VHS is, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of that way back in the day, you know. You know, it was maybe you got a couple trailers in the beginning, and I feel absolutely dated in the fact that you and I, you know, we're on the same page when it comes to movies, but that age difference makes me go, it was the Phantom Menace that made you go, I want to get it. I want to. I want to see this. Out of all the movies, it is the Phantom Menace that got me into movies. So At least it was Darth Maul. At least a cool-looking character. And that's all I ever saw until I watched the the new trilogy, or I guess it was the prequel trilogy at that that point. Uh, until two, three years after that, maybe I didn't watch Phantom Menace until Attack of the Clones was coming out. So, but that's kind of how uh, I got started with it. At least, at least again, they, you started with. The, the the original three, the the four, five, and six. And for the life of me, I can't remember if it was actually the original trilogy or if it was the special editions. More than likely, based on what you're saying, time frame, everything like that, I owned those three on the VHS, and even mine were the special editions. 
to try to find the original trilogy on old VHS tape is damn near impossible. So then, so, so more than less, li- more than likely, you have never actually seen the true. I have never seen the original the, the trilogy. True original trilogy. trilogy. No. no, no. So that is one thing I need to seek out somehow, some way to find the original trilogy without extra Jabba the Hutt and shitty dobacks. It's gonna be damn near impossible. And shitty snide snoodles singing in Return of the Jedi. <laughs> I don't think they're, they're – because the Star Wars trilogy has been modified who knows how many times after even the special edition. They've made tweaks here, there, whatever the case is. They're probably in some bunker somewhere is where you'll actually find the original unaltered Star Wars. They're hidden in George Lucas's basement. Skywalker Ranch, duh. Obviously, yeah. That is something I will have to seek out. And Disney, if you're listening to us right now on our uh, first episode – just release it, and you're going to make a ton of money. It's all oh. free money for you anyway, so... Oh, yeah. If they just release a standalone, just straight, original, un- unaltered... Just clean it up for Blu-ray, 4K release, and that's it. Heck, you could even probably release it in just straight... Dirty dirt- footage. <laughs> the dirty version, and people would still buy it. I think there is bootlegs, copies of that out there, so... Oh, yeah. They just recorded off the old, old, way old VHS. Yeah. Maybe they found some old Laserdisc. I actually did find a Laserdisc for... I believe it was Empire here in Sioux Falls. And you didn't buy it? I don't have anything to play it off of. Dude, you could have flipped it for like... <laughs> they were asking like 100 bucks for it. So. Oh, it probably could be easily sold it for more than that. Probably, but, but I wanted to watch the movie. Yeah, right? All right. But uh, let's jump into a little bit of news. So uh, as we're recording this, it is the first week of November. Uh, so we're just past Halloween. But uh, Brian, what is some of the news going on this week? I just recently came across that... Uh... The, the, the people behind Willy Wonka want to try to make a prequel to Willy Wonka, um, like the old, old school Gene Wilder Willy Wonka. Uh, and I, I really, I don't know what I think about that. You know, I don't mind even the Tim Burton remake of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Okay. Okay. I have a I have a weird appreciation for Tim Burton and Johnny Depp. They're they're a dynamic duo, of director actor. They're both weird. They're quirky. If anybody was going to try to redo Willy Wonka, because the only reason why Willy Wonka was called Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is because they wanted to sell candy. Because I mean, and Willy Wonka candy is fantastic. Absolutely, no plug there. Um, if you're listening, Willy Wonka, we would love for you to plug your podcast. <laughs> but at the same time, too, I'm sitting here going. There's there's a certain place in everyone's heart for the original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Gene Wilder did an amazing job. The kids did an amazing job. It's just a good, solid movie to try to prequel that, especially when one of the names that I saw in the article was Donald Glover. I had to step back for a second there. I'm all for you can cast whoever you want to cast if it's going to work, but if you have already have an established character, I don't necessarily know if you can go a, a race change. I have no problem with yeah. But in that point, how would it be a prequel if it was Donald Glover cast as the Gene Wilder? It, well, exactly. Younger version of Gene Wilder. Exactly. That's the part where I have a little bit. It, it to me, the it just didn't make sense, you know. And plus, we've already had a pseudo origin story out of with Christopher Lee, with Christopher Lee, the dentist, but with you know with the Tim Burton stuff and whatnot. So it's like, do we necessarily? Are we doing a prequel because we're going to try to do the character justice? Or are we doing a prequel because, eh, hey, we can make some money. We, we, we can make a few bucks. Exactly. For me, I, I hate this idea altogether. I don't care who they cast because Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is one of my top ten favorite movies of all time. Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka is top five characters in any movie ever. He's actually, he's the first Funko Pop I ever bought. It was Will- <laughs> Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka, and uh, when he passed away a few years ago, that that's actually one of the first like celebrity uh, deaths that got me because I grew up on Willy Wonka, and it was just something that's you know always been in my life. One of those movies you kind of watch growing up, and and wonder how much LSD they were on when they made it. Well, that too, especially with that tunnel scene, that's fantastic, straight out of a horror movie. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, if they want to do this prequel idea, I. For some reason, I also got this mixed up with the Labyrinth prequel that they're also working on. Because when I thought of the the uh, Willy Wonka one, I'm like, oh, I thought I heard about this a while ago with Jared Leto, but I think that's the Labyrinth one. Again, that would be one of those ones that for me growing up, uh, because the Labyrinth would be for me when I was a kid. That's you know way before you even. <laughs> um, prequels, sequels, whatever the case is, 
the labyrinth has gone this long to being a standalone. We no longer have David Bowie. I don't see you being able to redo, to bring back that same chemistry, to bring back that same magic that the labyrinth was, um, that it was with David Bowie. This is where I see the difference between the, the, the case for the labyrinth movie and then the Willy Wonka movie. Willy Wonka is, it's not necessarily about the universe. It's about Willy Wonka and his crazy character and his chocolate factory. That's what that universe is. Labyrinth, though, I think you have possibilities for other stories within that universe outside of David Bowie and Jennifer Conley. Jennifer Conley. The only way I would be, ex- ex- the only way I could personally accept a sequel to the Labyrinth is if Jennifer Conley was somehow involved. I couldn't, I couldn't see it being completely like one I, of her kids goes into that world or. Exactly, or even it being her little brother as an adult. Something to that effect where she has to come through again or whatever the case is. You know, if you can't bring back Bowie, then you need to have her because those are the two big, obviously the two big staples. Two big actors, but I think you can set something within that universe. It just won't be the same. It won't be the same, but with, with uh, we'll talk about him a little later, Fede Alvarez, he's the guy that's going to be in charge of that movie that they're working on, The Labyrinth prequel sequel looks like sequel whatever it's gonna be yeah uh with possibly jared leto but uh with fede alvarez behind it i think if you go crazy with it throw in a crazy performance by jared leto bring back all the puppeteering that's the biggest thing i think oh yeah don't go don't go cgi go go total jim henson if that's i think even more than bowie or jennifer connelly is the puppets I can't to make that. that work. So if you're going to do it, you have to go puppets. But, uh, yeah, I think something with Hollywood has this weird fascination with, right now, especially 70s and 80s movies, remaking them, or in the case of, like, Halloween. Sequeling no, them. Yeah, sequeling them or prequeling them. But come up with new ideas. Hey, for the sake that we're past Halloween, and you're bringing up Halloween, I at least will have to say, you know, for how many Halloween movies there are and how many I unfortunately have to admit to say that I have not seen. Shame. I know. I've seen all like 12 times. Almost. Okay, um, except the third one. I just watched that for the first time. It's fantastic. You say that now. After it only how many years. But no, having, I have, having had the opportunity to see the new sequel that just came out, true sequel, I enjoyed the fact that you know they basically connected that to the very first one. I was entertained by the idea that they basically turned the rest of the entire franchise and retconned it. And they're basically like, this didn't happen. And they threw in a couple of Easter eggs to say why it didn't happen. And I think it was a true good, true to form sequel compared to what other sequels do. You know, you run into those ones where it's like dumb and dumb or two. Something, you know, where they go back 10, 20 years later and do the same thing. Zoolander too, especially comedies do that. Yeah. But those are just two that come to my mind right now. It's just sequels that came out way too way too um, late. Yeah. Where that's where you and I have our differences on Dumb and Dumber. Dumb and Dumber is a fantastic movie that should have won all the Academy Awards. Except for the everything wrong about that sentence. But at least if you were going to do a sequel to Dumb and Dumber, you should have done that years ago. Screw this stupid prequel thing that they did. And Which Bob Saget is fantastic, yeah. Still, no. <laughs> that sequel should never... That prequel... No, it shouldn't have. It's a terrible movie. should never have happened, and that sequel should have happened years ago. Yeah. Um, no, it's just I unfortunately see the absolute magnificent talent that is Jim Carrey, that is Jeff Daniels, that is everything that is those two individuals, and they have absolutely amazing chemistry. And that movie does prove that. However, that is absolutely just one of the dumbest. So it lives up to its name. Oh, absolutely. Doesn't mean I have to agree with it. No, but you got to appreciate it for being, it's being honest with no, you. I just, but I think the biggest thing you're saying here is that if you're going to do a sequel, do it at least within a few years of the original. Hopefully, or at least if you're going to wait that long, give it purpose, give it meaning, give it a re- you know a reason. Like for instance, Martin Lawrence has just come out to basically say is that we're finally getting moving on Bad Boys Three. 
terrible movies. And that's where, again, I disagree with you. <laughs> and not because I don't think they're Oscar warning. Oscar award winning movies, not because they're very well written. There is zero plot holes. They're just good, fun, action popcorn movies. And you figure the first one is 23 years ago. The first one came out in 95. The second one didn't come out until eight years after that, 2003. We're going on 15 years since the second one. You know, as long as they do it right, and at this point here, it's not like they're like, we're going to make bad boys, but we're not going to get Will Smith back. We're not going to bring Martin Lawrence back. At that point, why do it? At least if you're going to do it, you need to do it justice and be like, okay, we're bringing back, we're bringing them back. I actually saw some fan-made art that had those two on it. It said Bad Boys 3, but it also included Jamie Foxx and Denzel Washington. I saw that, yeah. And I would watch that in a heartbeat. All of those, those four together, I think would just be just an epic good old fashioned cop slash action movie the movie i would watch if they crossed it over with anything would be that and then sam jackson and the rocks character from the other guys so they would have to do it before they jumped off the building and killed themselves i think it'd be fun- i think it'd be funnier <laughs> if they did it after and they survived we know they don't survive they go to the funeral well they can come back as like zombies or something <laughs> No, I'm pretty sure that's be not, fantastic. I'm pretty sure that's not how that works. I don't know. In that universe, I could see it happening. Well, at least that maybe sounds like a better crossover than the Men in Black 21 Jump Street that uh, Sony wanted. I think it was Sony that yep. that wanted to do. I'm like, mm-hmm. which what? now they've moved on with Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson to do which a legit, n- yeah, legit spinoff, whatever whatever they want to call it. I actually I'm intrigued by that, only because I like. Tessa Thompson. I like Chris Hemsworth. They have absolute amazing chemistry in Ragnarok, and to bring them to full circle to have them in another movie together, I think will be great. And Chris Hemsworth is actually hilarious. Chris Hemsworth is funny as hell. He's the funniest part of that terrible vacation movie with Ed Helms, which I'm pretty sure everybody listening has forgot about that movie ever actually happening. And he is probably the best part of the terrible Ghostbusters movie Sony released. Here comes the hate mail for that, too. What? Nobody's going to send you hate mail for Ghostbusters 2016. Oh, yes, they will. There's so much controversy about that stupid movie. And I was championing that movie long before it came out. When it first was announced with the cast and everything, I was all for it. It's a good, solid cast. It's a great. If you're going to do a female Ghostbusters, that is the cast. Absolutely. But it's just a terrible movie. Like, it doesn't... Would you say it's more on the writing side? Like the story? Yeah. Because, I mean... You, it's all on Kevin Feige. 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 Um, no, uh, Paul Feige. Feige. Paul Feige. <laughs> I'd say like, Kevin Feige does it's MCU. Feige does. It's all his fault. <laughs> no, Paul <laughs> Feige. It's all on him. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, Paul Feige is the guy that does Bridesmaids. Yes. And yes. He's uh, the guy in a heavyweights. Camp Counselor Tim. Oh, jeez. Great movie. <laughs> But yes, that is that is a case of that was all on him. I think the cast was given obviously what they had, but uh, it also didn't help. They should have just said it within the Ghostbusters universe and not re- rebooted it. Yeah, that's the part where I yeah exactly you should have just kept it in the same lines. I don't wonder if some of the reason why that that didn't happen is because of all the stuff with like the, the Bill Murray and thing like that. And he has the biggest part of all the original cast. That I know. is the craziest thing about it to me. I know because it's just that you know they they've been ta- they had been talking and talking and talking about you know Ghostbusters three Ghostbusters three Ghostbusters three you know and it's just one of the things that you always heard is the biggest hang up Bill Murray Bill Murray Bill Murray and then you get to this new one everybody has a cameo Bill Murray has a legit part then that just yeah it doesn't make any sense but if you're gonna do it you you should have said it within the same universe because uh, recently me and my girlfriend have been watching. The Ghostbusters animated series that came out mm-hmm. between one and two, and uh, that show's fantastic. Like, how is that not enough, you know, to say this should be the movie, right there? Them chasing weird, crazy ghosts. Because you know they they got to try to make it different. You know they had to they had to try to try to make it a Paul movie. You know, I don't know. Whatever. But yeah, that was our talk on Willy Wonka. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, by the way, we might deviate a little bit. A little bit, but I hope it's at least interesting stuff to you guys, and yeah. we're at least talking about movies all the time. Yeah, that's, but, uh, that's typically what we just do in general, just every day when we start rambling. We just end up going in like 12 different directions. Yeah, so these could end up being three hours long, and we talk about nothing we were going to plan on, so... Yeah, well, Which is all right. That's that's what bullet points are for. That's what they're for. So what is what is the next piece of news that we we should bring up? Well, I was gonna say is the next next thing I have on my little little sheet right here is uh, uh, you have the opportunity to go see Bohemian Rhapsody, something I really want to go see, and I just my schedule just did not uh, afford me that time. What did you think of Bohemian Rhapsody? It was decent. It's not as bad as what some of the critics are saying, and. It's, it's kind of a middle-of-the-road movie with Rami Malek giving a freaking fantastic performance. He is the best part of the movie. Yeah. That's Freddie Mercury. That That is what makes the movie. Um, for the longest time, they wanted Sasha Baron Cohen. No, no. Which I read... My, my understanding is that Sasha was trying to get the one to get the movie off the ground, but he ended up leaving the project because they didn't want to go the route that he wanted to go in. In his route, I wish we could have got, because that sounds nuts. Like, Oh, no, I tolerated... When I heard that Sasha Baron Frank. Cohen... Sasha Baron Cohen is one of those guys that I can take or leave. It depends on the role that what she's doing. Like, for instance, the his, like, allergy, the Borat, all that stuff here. No interest whatsoever. Just, I, I don't get it. And that's okay. Uh, but some of the other stuff I've seen, you know, his, his role in Sweeney Todd, absolutely mm-hmm. amazing. Some of the other stuff that he's done, when I heard about him doing Freddie Mercury, all in, totally, totally was all back behind that, you know. But no, when I heard of uh, Remy being Freddie Mercury, I was like, please, I, I need to see this, you know. It, but it's, it's all the rockiness that got us to getting there. Oh, this director, this is going to happen. This person's going to be the, the, the actor and thing like that. There was so much crap up to the point when they finally got the B.A. So like, we're making this movie. And you see that first image of him as Freddie Mercury, and you're like, that's it, sold. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, no trailer, nothing like that. I just, I just saw the image, and I'm like, his stature was just hands down perfect. And the movie reflects that. He is by far the best part. As I said, his performance is uh, it's Oscar worthy. Honestly, Wells, I ne- I've never seen Rami Malek in anything because I've never watched Mr. Robot or anything else he's ever, ever been in. I have seen the first season and I'm sad that I haven't finished what's currently on the air. Absolutely amazing. And you're telling me that you've never seen Night at the Museum with Ben Stiller? Okay, I have seen that. Yes. Okay, I'll see. He's say, the uh, like Egyptian king. Yes. He's, okay. He's like, so yes, that. I have seen Rami Malek in that, <laughs> but uh, this is the first big role I've seen him in, like starring lead role, and it's he's not in the movie. Freddie Mercury is in this oh. movie. <laughs> I was like, excuse me, I'm confused now. No, the whole time it took me a minute to get used to the teeth, and uh, but besides that, as soon as he starts talking and gets into it, that's that's Freddie Mercury on on the screen. He even pulls right? off the accent. He does, and Queen is one of my probably top five favorite bands of all time and they do everybody so this is what i had heard for the longest time is that halfway through the movie freddie would die as he does in real life and then it'd be about the band coping Mm -hmm. with that and continuing on without him i don't know if that's a spoiler but that's not the case in the movie which thankfully it's not because when you think of queen who do you think of you think of freddie mercury Yeah, you think of freddie mercury they do give all the other band members justice, so I like that. They give credit where credit's due on who wrote songs and who came up with certain ideas for the songs, but all in all, it is a Freddie Mercury movie, so on that uh, behalf, I think that's what really makes the movie is, is his performance. When it comes to directing and writing and stuff like that, or historical inaccuracies, I've seen people argue about that. Like It's a movie. Yeah. It's a two-hour time frame to tell 30 years worth of a story. Well, if I do my math, I'm pretty sure it's more than 30 years. They start They start when he's just getting started with the band. So, mm-hmm. But yeah, that's a 40-year-old man. By the time he died, that's how long you got to tell a story, and you only had two hours. So yeah, exactly. You condense stuff, and you make it work. And I think when it comes to that, it, it works that way. And I was going to say, you're going to run into some of the stuff where they there's some stuff that they're going to be able to do, some stuff they can't do because of limitations or copyrights whatever the case is there's other there's obviously bigger shit that goes on that says i can't do this or this we have we have to tweak it a certain way you know that's where it's like sometimes you get some of these movies where it's like the person watching the movie wants to be like one star because i hated this 
Well, it's almost like I tend to notice that those when people are reviewing movies that the, like the lower the rating is less about the actual movie that they saw and more about their expectations it's called movies called book called anything that's a review based anything it's almost and it's like i hated the football game because the guy that was commentating it what who cares <laughs> um i just you know i i'm i'm definitely looking forward to going being able to get a chance to go see that because i think there's only so much that you can do for a larger in life character in entity icon that is Freddie Mercury, and I just I I am so excited for that. I mean, if you're gonna talk about, in my opinion, the greatest lead singer of any rock band ever, you have to see it on the big screen. Oh yeah, that's absolutely. the only way to watch it. And I don't want to spoil anything that happens in the movie. They don't pull any punches really with him, which is good if you know the story of Freddie Mercury. And the final act of this movie, I gotta say, is really ballsy. Once you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a it's a really good final act, and it, it is quite ballsy to end a big major motion picture like that. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> You've got me intrigued. Yeah. Do I have to look? Do I have to you know go all MCU on this and go? Do I have to wait for the post credit scene? I did sit through the credits, and uh, no, it's just a live performance by the actual Queen band. So. Huh. You can actually sit through it because they play songs that they didn't have time to play in the movie. So the biggest uh, thing I have to say I didn't like about the movie Mm. is they didn't include the Flash Gordon theme song. That's your hang-up? That's my biggest hang-up. Because Flash Gordon is a freaking fantastic movie, and Queen has one of the best songs ever for that. He's the the savior of the universe. I mean, who else would you want to sing that song? You've seen Flash Gordon, right? Not the original. (sighs) Well, so you said you know the you know to have a, you know something like that. I immediately like I'm gonna go back to David Bowie. You know, there's you know there's certain icons that you just need to work together and you know experience whatever. That would be something I would be curious to see. You know, as if you're gonna since oh how, like a biopic on David Bowie. Absolutely. I mean, oh, I, I wish he was in the he's he's not in the movie, which sucks because I'm waiting for him because mm-hmm. they do play under pressure. Yeah, but it's not with Bowie. Which sucks, because I'm like, oh, I wonder who they would cast as David Bowie. Well, and that's where, because it just seems that, like, Hollywood is, you know, you know, they get their little highs and lows of, oh, we need to do this, we need to do this. Oh, this is being made over here, so we need to do this over here. Not too long before, all of a sudden, it's like, finally, Bohemian Rhapsody is going to be coming to theaters and whatnot. That's when I get, realized that I must have been living under the rock for, I don't know how long, that they're making a biopic for Elton John. And that's with Tom Hardy, right? No. Or it's a... Taron Edgerton. I yes. get the two mixed up because I think Tom Hardy was attached to it at one point. All I know is Taron Edgerton is playing, which I find the humor in that because of Kingsman. Because Elton John. Because Elton John it. has an amazing role in Kingsman too, and so to have Taron turn around and be which from the uh, little bits that I've seen, I hopefully I see that he's doing for Elton what Remy did for Freddie Mercury. The mannerisms, the look, the everything like that. It's total Elton John. He is the guy for that role. I am a huge fan of Taron Edgerton. He should have been Han Solo in the Han Solo movie. And I will say that till the day I die. And but, I'll say that they probably should have waited on Han Solo first. I'm just saying. But they should have got someone who wasn't just a freaking brick wall to act. Shots fired. <laughs> but yes, Taron Edgerton is the guy to be Elton John. And uh, I think with... The success of Bohemian Rhapsody. Hopefully, we get some more rock musical biopics. Uh, we had Straight Outta Compton a few years ago, which is fantastic, and then mm-hmm. we had the Tupac movie last year. All Eyes on Me has been like a couple years already. Two. Yeah, and then they they did it. So, they yeah, did I think do it was a year. Notorious B.I.G. as well. Yeah. So they're they're getting the like '80s rapper. So I, I would love to see some more biopics on some uh, rock bands. So what? Here's a question for you. What rock band do you want to see next have a biopic? Ooh. I guess if you're going old school classic, because, you know, there's some good ones. I'm a huge Linkin Park fan. Anybody who knows me knows that. But I don't think now would be the good time to do that. That would be something that maybe would be years down the road. Years yeah. down the road. Not even just a couple years, like many years down the road. Even though it's been over a year since Chester passed away, it's still way too fresh for something like that. That's why, as much as I want to see an Elton John biopic, the you fact think that they should have waited till he died. Well, yeah, especially if yeah, I, don't, I don't want Elton John to come on record and go, "God, that's fucking blows. <laughs> that is not right. That's not me. That's not me." 
if they could pull it off, um, and they do it, they would have the resources because most of them are, you know, obviously the rest of them are still around. I would be actually be very intrigued by a Nirvana biopic. I could be into that because of all of the trials of Kurt Cobain and you know everything that has come out of what what began as the grunge scene, what was the 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 crest of it all, what came out of the grunge scene between Nirvana and Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Temple of the Dog, all that stuff, you know, just coming out of Seattle and I just think that the story of Nirvana and where they came from and everything like that would just be absolutely a good solid I honestly I think but they would also have to do it right. They'd have to find the right people. That would be a very tricky one at the same Especially time. Especially with the controversy with his death and everything like that surrounding it. Oh, absolutely. But yes. I would I would like to see that one. I think that would be I think that would be a good a good, good solid if you did it right. You know, and you can use the term if you did it right with any damn movie, as you were saying with Solo. You know, that you don't feel that they cast Hans correctly. Yeah. Amongst, not, amongst other terrible decisions in, in that movie. One of those terrible decisions was not casting Donald Glover as Lionel Clarissian, because that was one of the best things about that movie. Oh, that is the best thing about the movie. I, Donald Glover, like, is my man. <laughs> He's your man? He's my man. You got him on speed dial? I wish. <laughs> he's a, he's like man crush right now, so. Okay. Not but, to, uh, well, I'm, I was going to say, it's not to divert a little bit here, but this is just out of my sheer curiosity here. There's all these things that they, with the solo movie, that they're like, okay, here's all these things that Harrison Ford talked about for all these years, and we're going to bring them to fruition in the origin story that is Han Solo. Is there anything that you think that they they brought up, they discussed, where they're like, you know, maybe we should just left that and just not brought that? Like me personally, you know, there's like, you know, he got he got through the the Kessel Run. <laughs> Words are hard. To I know. hated that part. Well, and there's certain things about it, like you know, yeah, I've got I I, I want to know how he met Chewbacca. I want to know certain these things were other cases, but like the one thing I loved about the Kessel Run thing is you didn't. It was know. Han's story. It was Han's story. Even Chewbacca didn't. Right. Like is, the way he told it, terribly. Yeah. It's just that I don't. I did not want to see the Kessel Run. I want to know that it was a. It was that whole. Again, it was the legend. It was the story. It was this, this, this. But you never knew exactly what it was. And now that it's actually come to screen, I'm not impressed. No. I just where I didn't realize that was the Kessel Run when they had the movie either. Well, yeah. And that's where it's like. I don't, like, when they did Rogue One, you know, it was the bridge between Episodes 3 and Episode 4, and they wanted to do origin stories. One of the things that I liked about Han Solo was the mystery of who he was before he met up with the Skywalkers. His origin story is A New Hope. How is that not his origin story? Well, I'm just talking... Because he's the scoundrel, the guy that's not going to help anyone else, and here he shows up at the end and... Yeah, but there's all these things that he talked about again. The Kessel Run, where they're just like, "Well, now we're gonna we're gonna do a true origin story, and then we gotta talk about all these things." Man, yeah, no. We're gonna find out how Han got his boots and how Han got his. Why the fuck is his name just not Han Solo? That's the biggest part that pissed me off. Where the freaking Imperial whatever gives him the name. Oh, well, what is your last name? I don't have one. Solo. I'm like, ugh. Hey, you know, but, garbage. No, but at least the one thing I will give for that though is Han Solo was a man of mystery up until international man of mystery. <laughs> Internet, anyway, um, you know, he was he was a man of mystery, and you know, you see that it's Han Solo is his fake name. It's the name that he goes by because he doesn't want people to know his past. Well, then you just basically said right there. They created his name because he didn't want to give his real name. Then at that point, it's like, then why, again, why are you give him an orange story in the first place? Mm -hmm. Whatever. So, that I, was, uh... I, 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 enjoy, I enjoyed the movie, but... It, you know, no, there's it, better Star Wars movies. It did nothing for me. Like, I knew everything that was going to happen. I'm like, Well, yeah, it's because we've been talking about it for how many movies for how many years. Oh, well, yeah, and they didn't change anything about what was in the old 
Star Wars legend stories either. Exactly. He was in the Imperial Academy. He met Chewbacca and freed him, and he became his, I don't know, what what would you call it, life partner? <laughs> his very hairy life partner. Yep. It, it was garbage. But uh, anyway, uh, that leads us to another man of mystery, Freddie Mercury. So uh, if for anyone who hasn't seen Bohemian Rhapsody, definitely check it out. Uh, it's it's worth watching on the big screen, and uh, I'd really hope Rami Malek gets some recognition when it comes award season that would be that would be good because yep. he definitely looks like it's and i wouldn't it. mind if uh the current iteration of queen plays live at the academy awards either or have Raimi come out as freddie mercury and sing with him because Raimi sings a lot of the songs in the movie I th- my understanding is that he did, it was all uh not lip sync but like dubbed over some of it was some of, some it, of was. it is him singing so which he has a really good voice too which i didn't obviously since we don't have freddie and queen's gone on tour or whatever they brought in adam lambert so, okay, so if, if they're going to bring on Queen, just bring those two up together because as much as American Idol that is Adam Lambert, that's like him and Queen and everything like that. That was like just the perfect. They actually work, yeah. That was a perfect yeah. synergy. Yep. What's 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 well, next on that? Well, the agenda? next thing you got on here is for Gladiator 2. Ugh. No, I, I actually completely agree with there. Again, that is one of those ones. Where, well, that's one of those things that's like we said is that if you're going to make a sequel. What is it, 18 years later? 1999, if I remember correctly. It's either 99 or 2000, but you're absolutely so, correct. So, yeah. A almost, person old enough to vote. Almost 20. <laughs> okay, so it is Monday It is Monday here. Obviously, this won't get out in time. I hope y'all voted. But, yeah, I'm going to say this in the past tense. You better have voted. We definitely needed this mid... Uh... Can we have a vote on whether they should do Gladiator 2 or not? <laughs> because I don't think they should. There's no... What story can you tell after this? Well, the, the, here's the reason why I'm I'm concerned with this here. It's not that they shouldn't make a sequel, because, again, you can make a sequel years later, do it justice, if you've timed it right, i.e. Halloween. Because Halloween is a magnificent sequel. The, the brand to, new one... To that, what? To Halloween? Yeah. They should have changed the title. I kind of get it, and I'm okay with that. So, I, I don't have a problem with the title part of that. That's just me as a Halloween but, purist prick. Yeah, yeah. Stop being a prick, you prick. Um... <laughs> But, you know, and you're talking 40 years between the original 1978 Halloween and now. You know, there's times it can work, and if it's done right. Where where I'm concerned is the fact that this is Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott's been down this road before, and it has not executed well. And that's with Alien, because Ridley Scott, you know, there... So you think James Cameron should do Gladiator (laughs) 2? I would watch, instead of fucking Avatar, do Gladiator 2. Um, he's a little too busy. Um, with those Avatar movies that are never coming out. No, but if he pulls off what I've read about him with the Avatar with the Avatar movies... Do you think anyone gives a shit at this point? Sort of. And the reason why I say it's sort of, and I'm not necessarily talking about the fans, the people who enjoy those movies. I enjoyed Avatar when it first came out. I went to go see it in the theater. I own it. Absolutely amazing, beautiful, wonderful movie. Beautifully cast. Solid movie. It's what James Cameron has done with all his millions and millions of dollars that he's made off of Avatar in Titanic. You know, he's got two of the biggest movies in the entire world. Two of, like, the top three, I think. Uh, yeah. The only, not the top, I think he has the top two. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that would be potentially having issues with that would be uh, Avengers. All the technology that has gone behind the Avatar movies, he's created. Like, the, 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 the stuff that he created for Avatar, for the original mocap and whatnot, is almost to the point where it's become an industry standard. One of the things that was to bring up in these new Avatar movies is the underwater worlds, these beings that live in the water. Sounds like he stated that he's cracked the code for underwater motion capture, and which is an absolutely huge thing because one of the things you run into with water is light refraction. You need light to be able to do proper mocap. So... If he can, if he's able to crack the code to say, I can do underwater work and bring these creatures to life, and if he can pull that off, that is a game changer in Hollywood. Wasn't he, like, attached to Aquaman, or is that some entourage joke? Probably some entourage joke. I think so. Because that's all been James Wan. But I I wouldn't be surprised, to be flat-out honest, is that since... James Cameron's been working on this Avatar stuff for how many years now? If James Wan is like, you know, I'm making an underwater movie, 
obviously people in the industry are going to talk and they're going to know and everything like that. And this underwater stuff has been talked about since before James Wan even came on to Aquaman. I bet you he's probably like, I need to go fucking talk to James Cameron because if anybody's going to tell me how to do it right, go talk to the man who knows what he's doing. Side Sidestepping. Like Gladiator Ugh. is Ridley Scott tried it with Alien. We got Prometheus. We've got Alien Covenant, everything like that, right? Bloom Camp of the wonderful um, Elysium and District 9, Chappie, wanted to make an Alien movie. He was on the verge of making an Alien movie, and Ridley Scott's like, I want I want, I want to go do that. And all of a sudden, Fox is like, okay. Again, I, 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 I personally have a problem just absolutely demolishing some movies. Some are really easy. <laughs> no joke. Um, I try to find the the purpose, the reason, the you know, these are hardworking people making their movies. It's their visions, whatever the case is. I can only critique so far because, you know, how many people go on to make these movies? I didn't necessarily have a whole lot of problem with Prometheus. You know, people are expecting Alien. This is what Alien is. You know, we're supposed to be trying to get back from what was Alien Resurrection. And then we get this weird thing that is not even aliens basically you know and it's like if he's going to go down the road how many years later he better do it right is all i can say does he bring back russell crowe russell crowe doesn't exactly he probably doesn't look like the nice ripped like 16 gladiator gladiator he did 20 years ago i don't know the thing i I don't know where you can go with it what what happens at the end of gladiator where where do you go from there like what you what don't. what can be your story honestly like if you're going to call it gladiator 2 to me that's a sequel to the first one what can you do well we haven't really all they just says they were we're looking at doing a sequel you know we don't necessarily know if it's gladiator 2 you know maybe they go the prometheus route and it's hey we are going to do this and but we're going to call it that and then it's going to be or like the son of gladiator or some shit like that. <laughs> the ma- the son of the mask. Yeah. <laughs> One of the first movies I saw in the theater though. The son of the mask. Son of the mask. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm, oh. I'm glad your taste in movies has improved. Oh, I didn't like the movie then. Oh, Jamie Kennedy. I love Jamie Kennedy though. So he kind of makes me want to actually watch the new Tremor movies. Because of him and Michael Gross side by side in Tremor movies. They're all right together. It intrigues me. I wish it was like Randy from Scream in those movies, though. That would be perfect. Very self-aware. Yeah, I wish. But, uh, yeah, I don't think Gladiator 2. Who cares? No. It's just like Passion of the Christ 2. What can can you do? Let's hope not nothing. Yeah. Family Family Guy already made a joke of it, so... All I know is that if they if they do actually green light green light and go with Gladiator two, that better be one hell of an intro trailer because you're gonna you're gonna have they to need sit. to have Kid Rock Ba with the Ba playing in this trailer again. No, you all but all I know is you're gonna have to you're gonna have to fucking hard sell me real bad for me to be even remotely interested. I, I'm gonna go back to the bad boys thing. Maybe that's just because I enjoyed the chemistry of those two, but I just, I see an image of those two talking about bad boys. They're like, all right, I'm in. What is that for Gladiator that'll pull you in? I mean, that's just it. I mean, if you see a picture of Russell Crowe on set, you're like, but he died in the first one. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, there's yeah. no winning. I no, know. there is no winning with that one. So due to recent events, which I am poorly and unfortunately behind on. We've Don't got- worry, I'm a little further behind than you are. Yeah, you should fix that. I'm only at least one episode. AMC has just recently announced that they are going to do three Rick Grimes TV movies for The Walking Dead. Now, I can only say so much. My wife, who is currently caught up on the show, could probably be a lot more uh, informed about this here. I am unfortunately the last Rick Grimes of the TV show series for The Walking Dead. That's the one episode I'm missing is the one from last night. So I'll hopefully get that watched here. I don't know what to think. I think that, you know, one of the things that people talk about is like The Walking Dead and the dipping ratings and everything like that. And it's boring. It's this. It's it's a male's version of a soap opera. There's two. Honestly, right now in the world, there are two male soap operas. There is The Walking Dead and there is WWE Wrestling. I, I get why some people are like, you know, I stopped watching, which is what you've told me is that yep. it, it's slow. It's slow. It's slow. I'm not caught up on the comic books. 
I have read the comic books, though. I'm as far as issue 100-ish, which is where they introduced Negan. For where they're at in the show, I'm not that far behind, but I also know that I think what AMC was wanting to try to be careful of is they didn't want to burn through the source material too fast. You know, you could have been like, oh, well, if we can do this in X amount of time, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, granted, that very first season was only six episodes. Last, I, I don't remember how many issues The Walking Dead is on. But by the time they get into season three, they had already used up 20, 25 percent, I don't know, ish of the issues. What, what was available. Yeah. I think what they were, they were afraid of is they were going to pull the Game of Thrones. You know, see, Game of Thrones is getting done. They're not going to be making anything more after season eight is done. But they've been they've been basically running on fumes because George R. R. Martin hasn't written his last book yet, and so they're just like, oh, well, I guess we got to write it now. This is our flagship show that is AMC right now. They don't have Mad Men anymore, you know. So we need to create Fear the Walking Dead. We need to start building these Rick Grimes movies, TV made for TV movies, which I'm all for. I mean, I'm a huge Walking Dead fan. Even for the days that, you know, the shows that are the, the slow episodes are the cases, I take it with what I know what it is. It's not, you know, some people are like, well, there's not enough zombies, so there wasn't any zombies in this episode or something like that. It's not about the zombies. It never has been about the zombies. It's been about the people in the zombie apocalypse. It's about these people. And sometimes in the zombie apocalypse, when there's no TV, there's anything like that, shit's going to get boring. Welcome to life. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to adulting in the zombie apocalypse. I'm curious as to, obviously, having not seen the last episode, I'm curious as to where exactly is they're supposed to go. Obviously, if they already know they have, they're going to be doing three movies, they obviously know what they have in mind. They know what they want to do with it. I know that Robert Kirkman, the creator of The Walking Dead, who is also one of the, is one of the main producers on the show, he's involved with the movies. So, you know, there's plenty for them to work off of he's you know he's going to basically the number one selling comic for image comics i think it's image comics that uh has you know so i think i think they can do it as long as they do it right they can do make their tv movies i just think you know you i think what you said something about you know now they want to create a universe or everything thing like that they've already created a universe they just are trying to go a different way about it because you know you're thinking you're like hey that's the TV show. You know, they've got the TV show. They have the video games. They've got the books. But the, the mass audience is what do they right. know of The Walking Dead? It's the TV show. And my hope is the fact that, you know, they've watched the show enough, not necessarily even the comics, whatever the case is, but maybe they've gotten into the books and stuff like that because the written books are phenomenal. But the written books are also based in the universe that is the comic book universe. So are these three TV movies going to be to help, exp I assume, to expand the TV universe? Yeah. So that's, I'm probably three seasons behind. Yeah, you gotta get something like there. that. I don't feel like catching up. I, it lost me. I don't think I can get back on it. But uh, I am actually intrigued by the movie, so I might just hop on and watch the movies if that makes any sense. No, that because. That... To me, The Walking Dead is the Rick Grimes story. If he's not on it, what's the point to me? You know, that depends. And I only say that just because of what I know of the comic books. You know, there's stuff in the comic books that have happened in the TV series and or that have not happened in Vice Versa and whatnot. Daryl doesn't exist yeah. in the uh, in the comic books. Um, Melissa McBride, who does Carol, who's absolutely... Doesn't she, like, die really early amazing. in the series? She dies before the end of the, the Governor, which means by the standards of the TV show... Her character should have been gone five seasons ago, three, four seasons ago. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but no, Melissa McBride is absolutely amazing. You know, and I just think as long as they they write it correctly, as me, who is a, a, a big fan of it, who's lived through all those slow episodes that's made other people drop off off the wagon. And as I sit here and I truck through the wagon, as long as they they write them and interweave them well, I'm good. I don't think I can hop on, back on. I, I'm I'm maybe for these movies because I like the character of Rick Grimes. I would love to see like the Robert Kurtzman. Kirkman. Kirkman. K I. Is that okay. Kurtzman. Kirk. Kirk. Kirkman. Kirkman. Robert Kirkman, the guy that made it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Kirkman. All right. Anyway, <laughs> I would like to see his movies because he has worked on movies in uh, in the past. So do, does Robert Kirkman go the, the Todd McFarlane route? So to go with. 
remakes, sequels, whatever the case is, to go off topic again. Spawn. So, based on, how, what, how old were you again in 99? Like, four? Five. You're five? Okay. That's when the first, it's either 94, 99 or 98, some way back then. That's when the first Spawn came out. Michael Jai White, um, Martin Sheen, John Leguizamo, obviously was horribly adapted compared to the comic books. At the time, in the 90s, Spawn was the number one comic period. And as much as I enjoyed the movie, again, I take a lot of things with grain of salt when it comes to movies. It's a bad adaptation. And Blumhouse, the makers of such one, they're, they're like the go-to wonderful they're people. They're my boys. They're the, they're, that is the go-to production company for horror right now. Mm-hmm. And that Blumhouse is going to be going and producing a new Spawn movie to be written and directed by Todd McFarlane, the creator of Spawn. I'm intrigued by this idea because it's the creator, so who who better to know the character than the guy that made him? You know, he's never been in this realm before. Is that, do you see that maybe as a good thing or as a bad thing? As far as what, Todd McFarlane? As, as to be the one that says, this is my vision, I'm going to put this on the screen. You know, I've never, I've never looked through, I've never looked at my character through the lens of a camera before. But who is going to know the character better than its creator? Yeah, but what I'm saying is that maybe he needs to make sure that he's got one hell of a uh, that's crew. Like, I think that's why they get, they're kind of going through the Blumhouse route. Yeah, definitely. Gonna, get that crew behind him. Because he's going to have to have, like, especially, like, the right cinematographer or something like yep. that. Because otherwise, you know, he's not going to know that kind of stuff. If they get Jamie Foxx, I think Jamie Foxx. Plus, I think the fact that they want to do it as a, like a horror-ish, horror-ish, wow, I almost sound, horror, sound like I said horror, horror. Uh, horror-ish type of movie. I would definitely be for that, you know, something that is, you know, 20 years too late. Creator-driven Spawn movie. Well, that's and that's where it's like, how many people nowadays that if they, they read comics or anything like that, Spawn was 20 years ago, you know? Yeah, they're going to have Blumhouse, they're going to have the, the creator, basically the one helmet and everything, but... Is it gonna is it gonna have enough steam? Is it gonna even? Are they gonna break even? You know, because it's gonna be very. It's gonna have to obviously be very CGI driven. Here's hoping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hopefully they're just riding that Blumhouse wave and they get that audience behind it too. Yeah. For the people who don't even know what Spawn is, get some I j- barely know what Spawn is. Yeah. 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 So, but it's... yeah, I am intrigued by it because it's not. I think it's for an entirely different reason than you are because you grew up what reading Spawn. Mm-hmm. Todd McFarlane. What gets me, what will get me to the theater for that movie is Blumhouse. Yeah. So maybe that's why they're and pulling if, that partnership. And if at least I would say is that if, if one is intrigued by possibly where they could go with it, um, HBO actually did an animated series, which was absolutely phenomenal. But again, that was also the height of Spawn. You know, that's when people, you know, who knew what this, that was. So, I don't know, maybe I need to go back and rewatch the animated series and try to get maybe back into that that groove. Mm -hmm. Uh, But at least for you, for someone who's... Instead of diving headfirst in the comics, just check out a few episodes of the series. Go go watch the original movie for the humor. (laughs) So... Let's see what we got next. Uh, looks like, well, we talked about them earlier uh, when we briefly talked about the new Labyrinth movie, but uh, they just announced just a day or two ago that uh, the script for Don't Breathe 2 is finished by Fede Alvarez, and uh, that one will, will be coming out before any Evil Dead sequels. So, have you seen Don't Breathe? No, I still need to. Have you seen Evil Dead? Absolutely, dude. I, uh, I, I, I saw the new one. Yo, no, no, no. Okay. I've seen the first Evil Dead. To my unfortunate to say is I've never seen Evil Dead Two. Absolutely love it. Oh, I've never. Oh. I love Army of Darkness, but no, I, I, I had to go see the the re, the remake of Evil Dead in the theater. That was one of those ones where the very first trailer, I immediately was like, I'm in. I this needs to be in my life. I need to see this. It's an absolutely amazing. Readaptation, obviously, since they flipped the script and the Ash role is played by a girl. And it took me the longest time as uh, Evil Dead is one of those movies like, that really made me want to start looking more into behind the scenes because of how the first movie was made with cheaply, cheaply, and freaking 20, 21 year old Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi making that movie. I'm like, oh shit, if these guys can go to a freaking cabin in the middle of nowhere and make a movie, anyone can do it. Granted, no one has. 
not everyone's going to have the talent of uh, Sam Raimi or Bruce Campbell. Right. No one has the chin for Bruce Campbell, so... Which is why it leads me to the new Evil Dead. It took me a little while to watch it because I'm like, Ash isn't even in it. Like, he is the whole reason you would watch Evil Dead. Maybe. But, but I mean, they, they, they took it a different route. And that is the way to go. And that's why I really like that movie. That en- The ending, that third act, is mm-hmm. fantastic. Oh, yeah. Just the massive amount of blood and just... It's just, she's just genuinely creepy. It is. Absolutely. It is. And they t- went a very good route because even that first Evil Dead movie is creepy. It is also very funny. And very campy. Very. Yeah. And so Evil Dead 2 takes it, it's not even a horror movie at that point. It's the comedy with... Yeah. With and, that, least, and then Army Darkness, of course. Least, you, know, you, you know, I felt more comfortable knowing that they were going to be redoing Evil Dead, knowing that Sam Remy was... On board, he was a producer. He was there to make sure that it was. I wouldn't necessarily say to be done right, but you know, he he'd have his input on his his in, his property. Well, the whole thing with that one was that they were eventually going to cross the two over the new Evil Dead with Ash's Evil Dead, uh, which is there is an after credit scene for that movie. Did you know that? Oh no, I saw that. All you, all you do is you literally just see Bruce Campbell's face for like a split second. He says groovy. Yeah, big groovy. deal. That, to me, that just looked like something of Bruce going, I want to be in the movie, but I don't want to be in the movie. Well, he's in every Evil Dead movie now, so. Well, yeah, exactly. So, I don't think, I didn't anticipate, I don't know if I even would necessarily want to have any sort of crossover. And that's only because the new Evil Dead went the dark, horror, gritty route of, like, what the first one was supposed to be. And leave it at that. Because if you start trying to intertwine Ash and the New Evil Dead, then you start. Then you want. Do you want? Then you want the campy. You want the funny. You want the the what, cheesiness that was Army of Darkness. What I'll say with that is the Ash versus Evil Dead TV series does a good job of bringing it more back into the horror aspects. Because Army of Darkness is straight up camp kind of action. Yeah, but wasn't wasn't Ash? Because mind you, I never watched it. Because, was it Showtime? Was, uh, stars. Stars. I was going to say, it was on one of those stations I don't have. But wasn't it more of, like, self-aware? Not really. No? No, it, it was a straight-up... They briefly bring up stuff about Army of Darkness, but it's almost a straight-up sequel to, I guess, Evil Dead 2, since Evil Dead 2 is basically a remake of the first one. That's kind of where it takes off, and it does bring more of the horror aspect to it than uh, than the even Evil Dead 2 did. But uh, back to the story at hand uh don't breathe too so you haven't seen don't breathe no but the ending of the first one does leave it open for a sequel and i'm glad they're finally going with it because fede alvarez is a fantastic director the first evil or uh, first don't breathe is great stephen lang is fantastic uh does a great job of building up not only atmosphere but also just tension of kind of like a home invasion movie except the person that's invading the home is the one being stalked if that makes any sense. Sure. And yeah, it's a, it's a great movie. If you haven't watched it, definitely check it out. And then the fact that they're doing a sequel, it only makes sense, especially if you've seen the first. So I'm all for it. You know, it's something that should happen, and I'm glad it's happening. Um, on the fact of it coming before Evil Dead, I don't think that was really in the talks now since Ash vs. Evil Dead has been canceled. No. I kind of think that franchise is almost dead in the water at this point. Yeah, I mean, it would take a little bit of work, I think. Though, you know, you talk about, you know, some, kind of some of these sequels you didn't kind of see coming and whatnot. The one that actually comes out next year that I heard about it briefly before I saw the trailer for... I forget what I even went to go see. Um, but they had the trailer for uh, Happy Death Day 2. Happy yeah, Death Day I, for, I didn't two. even know they had it shot when I saw the trailer. Right. No, no, I didn't either. I, didn't, I had no clue up until they released the promo picture that they were even considering making one and i only just recently watched the first one which groundhog day turned into a horror movie the only thing that i kind of wish that they had done is that i wish they would have gone for the r route but the fact that they did go to pg is a slasher movie should probably be rated r granted i fact- haven't seen the first one i have the movie i do intend to watch it i've heard it's all right for the fact that it's a pg-13 movie and the fact that the, the concept of the the movie where she dies over and over again until she figured out who her killer is. Um, when I saw the trailer for the sequel, I laughed through the whole damn thing. I cheesed out. No lie. Just because I found the humor in the first one of her trying to figure out who she, who was killing her. And then you see in the trailer 
where they basically flip the whole thing and she has to relive through this all over again, but bring all these other people involved and whatnot. I was like, you know, this is a sequel. It was immediate. It damn near looks like they probably filmed it when they made the first one. They just didn't tell you. But it's one of those ones where it's like, they did it immediately. They're pushing it out within less than, what, two years yeah. when the first one came out? I need to see that. I, I, this is a, this is something where I need to follow up. I need to see it. It's corny. It's campy. It's, it's not going to be Oscar winning. It's not going to be the, the horror movie that you're going to remember in 20 years, but it just looks like a good fucking fun. Just enjoy horror movie. That's a movie. I definitely need to check out the first, that, that second trailer or this trailer for the second one. It did nothing for me. Maybe I do need to see the first one. Well, but, see, that's but, just it is. I don't think like me, like, when my wife and I went to go see whatever the fuck we went to go see, <laughs> this is escaping me. Halloween, probably. That's exactly what it was. It was in front of Halloween. You know, my wife is watching this trailer. She's probably as confused as hell on what is going on. And I'm over here cheesing, but it's because I know everything's happening in the trailer because it's literally Groundhog Day with a, with a slasher film attached to it. I'm watching all this here and I think that's probably why I think if you rewatch that trailer for the sequel after seeing after seeing the first one I think it would give you a different look on that trailer in, in anticipation for the second one. I don't expect big, you know, box office numbers for it. It's a little small movie, whatever the case is. It's just a good fun for shits and giggles kind of movie. It's a good con I, I enjoy the concept. It gives Blumhouse enough money to start production on the next Halloween. Um, pretty sure Halloween, sure Halloween, yeah. pretty sure Halloween yeah. made enough money to make the production for Halloween. Well, then it, it allows them to, you know, double their budget for the sequel. Pretty sure Happy Death Day had nothing to do with that. Probably not, but... That was probably more of your Insidiouses and your Lights Out and your, basically, all your other franchises that Blumhouse is Much got. better franchises than... I have never seen Happy Death Day. I guess I can't say shit about it, but... Yeah, exactly. Fuck it. It's got nothing on Conjuring and Insidious, man. James Wan is king. James Wan is a modern-day mastermind. and he, he is our own... Well, I, I'm not going to say only. That's ignorant. He is part of the new group of guys that you would consider, along with John Carpenter, Wes Craven, George A. Romero. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Would, him, he's, would, he's definitely in there. Mike Flanagan is the top guy for me right now. Like, no one can touch him. He's freaking fantastic honestly one of the best directors out there right now so i would say yeah him and then throw in fede alvarez that's your big three in horror right now so what i would like to see is get james and get lee back together put them in a co-director situation because after watching only half of upgrade and seeing the kind of vision that lee Wanell has the kind of vision that james wan has those two, they helped build a modern day horror franchise, you know, when they, when they created the Saw movies, you know, and to have them, you know, at the time when they did they've Saw. Cre they've created two at this point. Insidious is both of theirs. Oh, as agreed. Well, so. Agreed. But like, you know, they, they created a modern day, a horror villain. You know, we hadn't had a good one in how long. Granted, maybe did Lionsgate push out more movies than they need to pooped out more movies than they needed to maybe i got me one with i got we got jesser bennington in one of those so you know what screw off man is me in the the last one before jigsaw it's either six the or seven 3D. yeah i don't remember i just remember he played a neo-nazi which is absolutely hilarious in that car his... scene right yes yeah that's the uh seventh one yeah. with, with a good twist that they do nothing with in jigsaw that pissed me off oh with carrie ells yes yes i like how is that not your next jigsaw in, in jigsaw Right. Like, have you watched Jigsaw yet? I, it's on my to-do list. No. It's 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 one of those ones. Take where it off your to-do list. It's one of those ones where I had to have it because I felt like it was incomplete to have the rest of the movies and not have the one. Yeah, but it's like you have all the Indiana Jones movies. You don't need Kingdom of the Crystal Skull in it. Which is funny because I'm looking at my Indiana Jones going. It's right there. It, it's right there, but there's no uh, Crystal Skull. Oh, see. Granted, all every Saw movie is Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Skull to me. No, the first three. It's one of those ones where they could have stopped it at a trilogy. They basically they could have stopped where James Wan and you know Lee Winnell. They were on there as like producers and stuff like yep. that, shit like that. You I know, think Lee wrote the first three. Yeah, you know, but anyway, getting back to this, I think that if you were, if you could get those two any capacity, I think those two are just a very good modern, just 
They they have such a beautiful vision. Give them the Justice League movie. Yeah. It's almost one of those things where you need two directors for it. Look at the Russo brothers. I think what they did with that many characters, you got to have more than one mind behind it. I don't disagree. I will say this much, though. As much as I'm anticipating Aquaman, I think James Wan did a good job with what he had when he did, um, when he was working on the Fury, uh, Fast and the Furious. Yep. We, we we don't exactly have the best, best track record with DC movies. I think that Zack Snyder's put a very bad taste in my mouth when it comes to those. David Ayer, I don't think, I think that was a problem with too many hands in the pot. I think if David Ayer could have just made his Suicide Squad the way he wanted to make Suicide Squad, I think it would have been a better movie. Agree. Right now, out of the DCEU, hands down the best one is is Wonder Woman. Um, and even that one's, I don't think, can touch more than half of the Marvel movies. No, no disagreement. No disagreement. But that's where it's like, Aquaman looks good. I have a huge appreciation and love for the work that James Wan does. Until I can actually see the result of that work is before I can say, give him the Justice League. Oh, that's okay. I get what you mean. Yeah. Is that, you know, they, they've already fucked up that universe so bad. Let's make the Justice League and then let's do spinoffs. And then like, let's have our second movie. out be Batman versus Superman. Where just, Superman dies in our second movie in our universe. It's just, uh, yeah. I mean, I, odd choice. I just like, Zack Snyder, I, I like Zack Snyder's type of directing. The Watchmen and 300, his remake of Dawn of the Dead. They're good, solid movies. He has a very beautiful vision when it comes to certain things. For the sake of, like, Batman, no problem. He's got the dark feel. He's got that dark look. I could see him doing Batman. When they put him on to do Man of Steel, Man of Steel was too dark. He's too dark for the Superman universe. And... I think that that direction was not, to me personally, the right direction to go. Zack Snyder is good at what he does. Again, no arguments. But I don't think having to try to build this new universe after to try to create this big entity to try to go up against the MCU after you have to compete with the Nolan trilogy to get Zack Snyder. Yeah. It just wasn't the right move personally, I don't think, anyway. No, I agree 100%. I do like Man of Steel. I have problems with it, as everybody else does. Yeah. But I think even the best parts of Batman vs. Superman, I thought, were his direction of Superman, at least shot-wise. Like, it felt, it almost felt like an Elseworld Superman to me. Mm -hmm. Like, if Superman was, was more gritty, which I guess is what they were going for. But, uh, yeah, as you said, this that series of movies just has a ton of problems. Aquaman, for me, I don't care. He's the guy yeah. that talks to fish still. <laughs> and now he's the hot guy that talks to fish. I don't care. The only reason I'm going to see it opening weekend is because of James Wan. If it was any other director, I wouldn't watch the movie. I, I do, could care less. I do at least... He looks ridiculous in his actual Aquaman suit, too. I, I do at least appreciate the cast. I think they ha they do have a good, solid cast. I'm I'm intrigued at the fact that we've got James Wan working with Patrick Wilson again. Absolutely. It's almost like... Hey, I, you know, I'm making a Superman or I'm making a superhero movie. You know, I've already worked with you like 17,000 times. I need you in this. Yep. Don't worry. I'm not going to bring any spooky shit with me this time. <laughs> we don't know that yet. That's true. <laughs> we don't well, know. Willem Dafoe is in the movie. <laughs> we, we don't know if we're going to get jump scared just yet. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like such a cynical asshole when I say that, but well, I don't. Like, the only thing that is intriguing me is James Wan and then the side characters. I don't care about Jason Momoa. To me, he's freaking, I don't know, just this hot guy from Game of Thrones still. And I, I'll, I'll spin it a different way in that they have had so many issues with the, the DCEU or whatever the hell they want to call it nowadays. Jason Momoa, I do think, though, is a good, solid choice in that, you know, they can't just do like what, like you said, he looks ridiculous in his comic book traditional looking suit. traditional yep. suit and whatnot. He, he, he so. Does. The fact, they, the fact that they went, like, the Poseidon look-ish, the Trident, all that stuff that they did for, like, the Justice League and whatnot, you need someone like Jason Momoa. You, because, I mean, if you really, if you cast him, like, what the comic book looks like, it wouldn't be Jason Momoa. It'd be Patrick Wilson. I would be fine with Patrick Wilson as Aquaman. But nobody would go see that. No. You, you need that guy who's going to be like, you know, he looks like he, when he goes to swim, <laughs> he looks like he's not going to be out of breath in yeah. ten minutes. That's you true. need the guy with the, you know, the... 
nine pack app, you know, 16 apps, you know, kind of thing. I'm looking forward to it, but you know, you look at some of the stuff that DC has done, you just you you want to shake your head and confused and like um, the 17 I, different Joker movies they're working on. Well, that's just it. I was looking up Suicide Squad 2 after the whole talk about James D- Gunn. DC, no, James or, Gunn. Uh, James Gunn, sorry. James Gunn getting hired on to write and possibly direct. Their Wikipedia page. He, that was never confirmed. That which was that that's news to me. Anyway, um, that was all rumored that they are talking to him about it. Mm. Anyway, all I know is that like if you look at the Wikipedia page for Suicide Squad and talks about the sequel, you can damn near fill your page with the stuff of the possible sequel. This this person's directing. This person's writing. At one point, they said that Mel Gibson was attached to direct. I remember hearing about and that. all this stuff here, and it's just like. Oh, and then this is going on, this is going on, but then we're going then we're to... we're going to have a spinoff with Harley Quinn and the Joker, except we're going to have a spinoff with Harley Quinn and Catwoman and Poison Ivy. the Birds of Prey. Which, then, I guess, is the one that's happening? Yeah, that well, the Birds of Prey is the one that's supposed to be... Because they cast Ewan McGregor yeah. as Black Mask, right? Yes. Uh, is it Birds of Prey? What did they have? Got- Gotham City Sirens? Or, yeah, yeah. I think that was enough... Yeah, is that the one that is happening? Well, that's just it. You and I are. I don't so, know. I don't know which one's happening. You, got, you, you and I are both so, so confused because of that. We're gonna do. We're gonna do Joaquin Phoenix, which I'm intrigued by the Joaquin Phoenix Joker, which is the way I think that DC needs to start going standalones. But they're like, okay, we got Joaquin doing an origin over here, but we're gonna still keep Jared Leto over here. And then I've also heard of. You know, Jared Leto over here going to be doing Morbius as another comic book, The Vampire yeah. Guy. And it's just like, there's just so much that's going on. DC is just like, I, I swear, it's like the 52-card pickup. They're just yeah. throwing shit in the air and hoping it lands. They're pulling a Sony from three years ago with their Amazing Spider-Man universe. Remember that? Oh, they yeah. They had the Amazing Spider-Man 2, and then they want to do, oh, we're going to have a Sinister Six spinoff and a uh, Black yeah. Cat spinoff, and then Spider-Man 3, and then everything's going to come together. And Marvel, Marvel has made this absolutely epic universe, and everybody wants to try to... Have make, their own. Yeah, yep. and nobody can seem to be... Pulling it Universal off. monster, the dark universe. The dark universe that never it's done. Yeah, I was gonna say we've kept scrapped. Up, which I'm kind of sad by because when you see like the likes of like Johnny Depp and Javier Bardem and all these wonderful, talented people, and you're like, this could be good. But did you watch the Mummy? No, I did not watch the Mummy. Fucking terrible. Like it's worse than the worst Brendan Fraser one. <laughs> So, I, don't, I don't know. I never saw the one where he came back, the uh, tomb. Oh, the one with uh, like Jet Li? Yes. That one? Yeah. I've never seen it either. It's probably better than Tom Cruise one. Tom Cruise's scream in that movie is the best part of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, everybody is trying to copy that Marvel formula, and the only the one that's got it right is, oddly enough, the Conjuring universe. Yeah, between that and... Because the Conjuring universe is going to be Annabelle. It's going to be... The Nun. The Nun, all that, absolutely. Yeah, Conjuring 3. Yeah, Annabelle 3 now. So that's the only one that's actually got it right and is successful. Which is kind of funny considering the fact that, you know, you know James has got his hands in there a little bit for the yeah. most part. He's just like, yeah, guys, okay, go have fun. Just don't fuck up my work. Yeah. And he's pretty much a really hands-on, at least for their writing... At, or at least giving stories for Annabelle 3 and Conjuring 3, so mm-hmm. he still at least has his hands in that in that pot over there, but uh, that's the only one that's got it right, and so uh, DC can take a look at those, and I mean, it's still the Warner Brothers family, they should at least have it figured out that way. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, do we have any other uh, news topics we'd like to discuss? Mm-hmm. Well, I guess nothing off the top of my head other than um, some stuff that we got going around here. Yeah, so uh, each week I think we'd like to what jump into some local Sioux Falls events. Uh, we, we are based out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I don't know if we said that. Uh, Freaking, I guess, one of the biggest cities in South Dakota. That... I know we are the biggest city in okay. South Dakota. But like Mr. Iowa doesn't know his I don't know. he doesn't know his South Dakota geograph you know nope. geography. Yes, we're like a quarter of the population. We're on the uh, east end in Rapid Cities and the West End and there's nothing else in the middle. What do we got going on in Sioux well, Falls? Well I was gonna say though is that if you know, if anybody that is listening, whatever, has any, you know, thing that we want that they want us to talk about and or um, events, things like that that maybe we're not aware about to let us know so then that way 
we can certainly, you know, bring those up. I'd be more than happy to absolutely put in a plug because I know that we just recently, you know, saw a little short film for uh, Werewolf, uh, Werewolf Pro- or Warwolf, Warwolf, Warwolf Productions. Yes. I always miss the fact that there's no e in there. Warwolf Productions, little short film, boogeyman, boogeyman kind of thing, whatever. Yeah, Mr. Pointy. Mr. Pointy. Yep. Which which is a is a good short. Yeah, for for like the what eight minutes it is, I mean, it was less like than, less than that. I, I was like. I, I, I want to see more. Yeah, he's good. I, I've met him before at uh, this year's Supercon here in Sioux Falls, and uh, that's actually where I watched it for the first time. He showed me it off his cell phone. Ah, well, that's a good place. Be. Before he even released it online, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, we'll have to get something for that put up as well. Yep. Um, but I do know that um, we've got uh, Cinema Falls, which is a local place here also in Sioux Falls that does... Um, more independent movies showing stuff like that down over at the West Mall 7. Um, on the 13th, they're doing Brewmaster, which to me it looks like it's a documentary, obviously. Yeah, it's on a documentary it. about beer. I mean, how can you? The only thing that would make that better is that if I could have a, go to the West Mall and have a beer while watching the documentary they, about beer. I want to see it. I they don't got, know if it is. The city denied it. No, they can still have it. They get like a one night license for alcohol. But I don't know if it's at the West Mall, but I know they are serving beer from Fernson, which is a brewery no. here in South Dakota. Brewmaster is going to be at the icon because I think that's one of the things that I noticed is the fact that they're going to be able to have beer at beer, at Brewmaster. But while you're looking that up, um, yep, icon, I, icon, 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 event hall, yep, in downtown Sioux Falls. Perfect. Yep. Um, what time is that? Uh, it looks like seven o'clock. Doors open at six, seven o'clock, uh, and it is hosted by Ferenson Brewing Company. Ah, which is a local. Yeah, local that's brewer. my brewing company right there. That's my beer. For that's, that's your beer? That's my beer. Where didn't you bring the beer? Come on, man. I know. Um, I'm actually out of it. I don't have any at home. Jeez, man. Um, on the 11th and 14th, um, Fathom Events, as that is part of the Century Movie Theaters, is going to be bringing in Die Hard for the 30th anniversary. And you decay, motherfucker. Die Hard, I gotta tell I don't know if I've ever told you this. Die Hard is like one of, if not my favorite movie of all time. Such a great it movie. It is. Such Hans Gruber is the greatest villain of all time. Any movie for me. That's because Alan Rickman was absolutely amazing. Shoots the glass. I mean, to, rea- to realize that it's, that it's been 30 years since that movie came out, I was definitely not old enough to go see that movie when it was in theaters. I wasn't even born. <laughs> you weren't even thought of yet. No. Um, I absolutely want to go see that in the theater. I think that would be absolutely amazing. I think on the big screen, that's just one of those movies that you just need to be able to experience. At least once, yes. At I've, least once. I've never actually gone to like one of these Fathom events where you watch an older film. No. Nope. So, the only but fath- if I'm going, it's going to be to die hard. Yeah, that's exactly. the big thing. Last time I was at a Fathom events or something like that, I went to go see Batman's The Killing Joke. That was the last oh, one I went to go see for The one night only thing? The one night only thing, and I felt, I actually kind of felt a little ripped off. Yeah, because it's well, not a good movie. No, it wasn't. The Killing Joke stuff is awesome because it's just The Killing Joke. That wasn't even the part. I think, well, part of it is I got, to, I got to the end, I'm like, that was it. I just bent that. I've been here for like 35 minutes. It was short, sweet. I was like, this didn't need to be a Fathom event. On the same night as the 14th, Indie Events is actually going to be doing the 4K restoration 1966 version of Django, which is like, maybe I need to go see Die Hard on the 11th so I can go see Django yeah. on the 14th. Yeah. Here's hoping that if they, you know, because obviously with some restorations, you know, it depends on the source material. Hopefully they've gotten the, like, the original, like, film print of that to do the... Uh, a good solid restoration. I want that stuff to look so clean. Oh yeah. But like look like it was released in theaters yesterday. Yeah, but you know what? I'm also not going to be that guy that's going to bitch and complain because it's how many years old? Yeah, you know if, if I don't even want to go and do my own math correctly here, 50 years old, just about you know, over 50. Yeah, over 50 years old. So you know if it looks like shit, it's also over 50 years old. Yeah. But yeah, that's Indie Events is another group uh, along with Cinema Falls that does independent movie screenings here in downtown Sioux Falls. Typically one night only kind of things. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a couple showings, but typically just one night only. Yep, and that one's held in uh, Club David in downtown Sioux Falls. Uh, they do a lot of cool stuff. They get like uh, uh, Q and A's with like directors and stuff like that. So that's always cool. I don't think you can probably get a Q and A for this one. I'm pretty sure most of these people are uh, dead, dead or uh, sitting in a retirement home. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to see this. I've never watched the original Django. Obviously, it is the inspiration for Django Unchained and many other Tarantino movies. Um, and it's just because Tarantino is amazing makes me intrigued to see it. This is what's inspired him. Yeah, exactly. What do we have in my notes here? I don't know. Oh, theaters coming this weekend. Is this all this weekend? All this coming, yep. Uh, for, let me pull up. Are you sure? I... Yeah. Okay. Because you have on here The Grinch. Yep. For those that may or may not know, obviously it's a kid's animated movie in regards to The Grinch, as in The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. I'm intrigued by it because Scott Mosier, who is one of the producing buddies of Kevin Smith for years upon years, ever since way back since in Clerks. The, since Clerks. He's co-directing it. Probably would be something that I would wait to go see, you know, either at the Cheap Seats, a.k.a. the West Mall 7, or just wait for a home video for something for, like, my kids or something like that. I don't want to look like that creepy dude that's going to go see the kids movie. I think I might actually have to watch this one in the theater, only because my girlfriend is, like, in love with Benedict Cumberbatch. Mm -hmm. And when I told her, he's, I'm like, that's... Doctor Strange as the Grinch. Oh, we have to go watch it now. No, that's so. That's I true. at least won't be the creepy guy sitting in the back, but I might be the creep, creepy guy give, shitting on this movie. Yeah, but you know, you say it's like I don't want to be the creepy guy to go see the kids' movie as I'm sitting there going like hell. As I will go see Ralph breaks the internet. Wreck It Ralph is amazing. I've never seen it. Oh. Do you have it? Can I borrow it? Yeah. Okay. I need. I know. I need to Actually, watch it. Over. Overlord. 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 WW two. Nazi. Nazi zombie. zombie movie. When did that become a thing? Please, it's been a thing in video games for years now. Yeah, but just, why? Why? Why Nazis and zombies all of a sudden like? Because it was. It, I know there was movies in the seventies. Like, no, doing it's shit like that. Call of Duty. Everybody liked the 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 multiplayer and all that stuff, and then we had mixed zombies part of it and everything like that. But you know, I'm intrigued again because it has um, his name is escaping me. Um, it's the guy that plays Fitz on Agents of Shield. Um, he is in the movie. Why Ian DeCaster? Ian DeCaster, thank you. Um, He's great as Fitz. I love him as Fitz. I actually love Agents of Shield. Um, Wyatt Russell, aka Kurt Russell's son. Which, if my memory serves me correctly, he's named Wyatt because of Wyatt Earp, as in Kurt Russell playing <laughs> Wyatt Earp. Um, I immediately, I was just looking at the IMDb page, I saw Wyatt, I was like, God, that looks like, well, his last name is Russell, let me just, you know, fact check. Well, sure, shit, hey, look, you know. I, again, I start to feel old when I realize that the people whose movies I've been watching for these years have kids that are old enough to be adults making movies of their own. Overlord, me personally, I think it actually does look very good. I, I like the spin of, you know, because, I mean, we've done zombie movies. We've done bio-virus movies, whatever the case is, what this kind of looks like here. We've but done Nazi zombies. Have we? In what? Um, i got to think of the name of it. It's yeah. like Cold Something. Yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah, well. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. But I, Okay, something that maybe would be more widespread than something that would be directed video. It wasn't um, directed video. Anyway, the sequel to The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Yeah, what is it? Girl with the Spiderwebs. Dead Snow is the name of that movie. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Come on, Dead Snow's fun. I don't, I don't know what to think Girl of... Girl and the Spiderwebs. I, I don't know what to think, just because I, I think that the Daniel Craig version of Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, I think they did a good job with that movie. I think they should have just kept on making and getting that those sequels made off of that cast, or whatever the case is. I think... Don't quote me, maybe. This one is directed by the guy that did the originals back in Sweden. This one's directed by Fede Alvarez. Oh, the girl so with no. the spiderwebs? Yeah. Oh, all right. Then then I'm completely wrong. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know. I'm not sold. Maybe it's just because I don't know anybody in the movie. Maybe it's just because it's been so many years since they've done the Daniel Craig Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. But I'm just like, um, I don't know. Yeah, just, this one, I've never watched the Daniel Craig one. I've never read the books or... Or I've never even seen the Swedish versions of the original no. movies. You know, Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest, all that stuff. Yeah. It's not really something that interests me. The only thing that would is Fede Alvarez directing, but it's like, it's not really a horror movie, so then it's like, what's the point for me to go to it? 
it's not my type of thing, you know what I mean? You know, if you want to do more of these things, I'm just saying, you might have to you know, venture outside of the box. Outside of horror? Outside of horror, yes. They're yes, but... Uh, action it's, movies. It's, it's, maybe, maybe you need to go see a good drama. Maybe go see a good comedy. Because should. obviously, if your choice of good comedies is Dumb and Dumber... What else do you need? A better one? Monty waiting. Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, you know, hey, if I'm just going to go with cheesy comedies, Waiting, Office Space... Seen them, seen them. Yeah. Good. I've seen I'm I, comedy is right next to horror for me for what I've seen, but it's like Dumb and Dumber is the best. And the Ballad of Buster Scrubs. Yes, that is a new uh, Coen Brothers movie. Have you heard of this one? No, I haven't. But I'm I'm always intrigued by the Coen Brothers. But the Coen Brothers are also kind of a a hit and miss. Like they've got some good solid movies. They got some ones where it's like, eh, you know. So what's the premise of this one here? So the premise uh, of IMDb is an anthology film comprised of six stories, each dealing with a different aspect of life in the old west. So some of the cast: mm-hmm. Liam Neeson, okay, James Franco, okay. Uh, let's see, I'm not Clancy Brown. In fact, it looks like you're scrolling and to I, try to find names here is not. Tim yeah. Blake Nelson is the one I've seen uh, mostly in the trailer. But yeah, it is directed by the Coen Brothers. Because I'm just sitting here going, you know, if there's one thing they're good at is a good ensemble cast movie. And so far you've only given me like two names. So it's that- James Franco and Liam Neeson. I mean, like, but yeah, it's an anthology movie. So have we really seen a Coen Brothers do anthology? No, but, you know, maybe there's a reason why we have it. I had big, huge hopes for Burn After Reading, and I felt burned after I watched the movie. Like, I needed my two hours back. Oh, but yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of interested in it. I've seen a little bit about it. The thing that's catching my eye right now Mm -hmm. is it's billed as a comedy drama musical. Wasn't that Hail Caesar? Sort of. I never watched Hail Caesar. I heard it was terrible. We'll see if that's just it. Maybe it was an absolutely great movie with a star-studded cast, and you're just like, eh. But I saw the reviews on it. And it gave us the guy that's Han Solo, so... Well, that wasn't the last thing he did. And, you know... Before Han Solo, I think it was. I think that's what got him the role. Because he was, like, the breakout star of Hail Caesar. I don't know. I never watch it because, you know, for me, sometimes the Coen brothers, again, like I said, they're, they're kind of a hit and miss wherever the case is. You know, it's like, is it on my to-do list where I need to go see that movie? Or is it, eh, I'll see when I get around to seeing it or whatever, you know? As I look at my wonderful The Outsiders... No. Whereas if you've never seen that one, you need to see that one. I love The Outsiders. Okay. That was my favorite book growing up, too. That was the actually yeah. two, two, my two favorite books. Not to go off the fact that this isn't about movies, but they're books that have been made into movies that are both A, really good movies, and B, really good books, is The Outsiders and To Kill a Mockingbird. Both fantastic. And both of them, I we read the books and watched them in school. Yeah. I didn't see... I don't think I saw The Outsiders in school, but we did have to watch... Um, to Kill a Mockingbird. Gregory Peck. Yeah. Fantastic performance. To Kill a Mockingbird is one of those ones where as I read the book in high school and I absolutely fell in love with the book. Absolutely, you know, appreciate the movie. I'm not going to nitpick over, you know, one saying about the book versus the, the movie kind of crap. They're both epically beautiful. Two different mediums for the same absolutely. story. But it's I do just have to say to there's two versions of The Outsiders. Do you go off topic before we go off the air? We're going off the air well, already what after if, one episode. No. Oh, shit. No. Fuck. No, that's not what I meant. Is There's the regular version of The Outsiders, and then there's one that's called The Complete Novel. Back when Francis Ford Coppola made The Outsiders, people were like, we can't sit through two hours of a movie. This isn't something we can do. And so the studio made him cut parts of the movie out. I think the complete novel version of the movie is like 23, 25 minutes longer. has a whole different intro, whole lot that's added that was missing from the books because it was the movie that he... It's Essentially, it's his director's cut. And I tell anybody, especially if you love the book, is if you're going to watch The Outsiders, find the complete novel version of it. Don't watch the the regular version. The whole, like I said, the whole intro is different. Um, it's just so much better. I will definitely have to check that out then. Yeah. So, <laughs> right there. Uh, so, out of these four movies that we have coming out, are any of them intriguing to you? We got The Grinch, Overlord, Girl in the Spiderwebs. What was the last one? The Ballad of Buster Scrubs. Buster Scrubs. Well, since it's very not very often I have a Coen Brothers movie where I appreciate the Coen Brothers. They're quirky, they're different, they don't make your typical movie, but it's, eh, I could probably wait. Um, Grow Up with the Spiderwebs. Again, maybe it's because um, they're going off a different way. Maybe they will 
win me back, I don't know, probably Overlord. If I were to go to any one of these in the theater right now, it probably would be Overlord. I'm probably in the minority compared to some people, and I imagine that out of all these, maybe spider webs would be the one. It would be a tie probably between Grinch and spider webs, and probably Grinch winning because it's got the audience. It's going to have the wider spread audience. Yep. yep, so out of all these, I'm, I'm on the same boat as you. Overlord would be my go-to. The one I'll actually probably end up seeing will be the Grinch. I think that'll be the top one at the box office, the one that everybody will be talking about next week. So mm-hmm. it is what it is sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think that's that's going to be a wrap on our first show. Yeah, absolutely. We'll definitely try to get these out here. We're, we're still trying to determine what we're going to do for, you know, how often these are going out. But yeah. we, we want to try to be, obviously, as topical as possible, So yeah. as well as ranting and raving about other shit along the way. So hopefully once a week on these, uh, we do have some other shows, hopefully planned in the pipeline once we get uh, this one figured out and all the uh, all the other little things with it, get our mm-hmm. website up and running. But uh, with that being said, we do need to plug some of our stuff, I guess. We should probably do that. What are we plugging? We've got to plug the website backlot605.com yep uh, it's, it's definitely a work in progress it is right a work now. in progress uh this will be one of the first things actually on there uh we were waiting for i guess our first content to really put it on there uh what else do we have on there anything a few short films that i worked on in school yeah that's about that's it that's about it I, we'll, we'll get our uh, profiles and stuff like that on there so you guys know a little bit more about us um mm-hmm. and stuff like that you can follow us on facebook uh right facebook now. um once we actually start getting some of the stuff posted out here we we're, we've got uh, the Twitter account. We've got our Instagram account. Um, yeah, it's all just Backlot605, so yeah. we got lucky with that. So, uh, yeah, I think that'll do it for now. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, also YouTube, right? Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll make a little we'll we'll post out there too, right? Everything, man. So, yeah. uh Awesome. Any any last words? No, no. I just I, I hope everybody enjoys us ranting and raving, and hopefully we'll be able to continue to keep on uh, uh, keeping on, basically. Yeah. So uh, if you guys have any topics you want us to talk about, just shoot us a message on any of those platforms. Uh, if you have anything you want us to plug from the Sioux Falls area or South Dakota, uh, do the same. Absolutely. So, uh, until next time, I'm Casey. I'm Brian. We'll see you next time on Backlot Six Hundred Five.